without further ado, Mr. Devsinger, please. Working? Yeah, I think it is, yeah. right? Okay. Um, I, I actually brought slides with me. First of all, speaking to this crowd, I've been asked to speak about what is the cause of the opioid overdose crisis that we're hearing about every day in the news. So I have a very short talk. It's drug prohibition and the war on drugs. See ya. Okay. <laughs> because actually that's the real answer, okay? But um, even though that's very easy for me to say, and everybody here in this room I'm sure understands that, the fact is that when you go out into the world, hmm, is it, I'm too loud, right? No. No, okay. When you go out into the world and you're uh, dealing with people who, pull, who control things, the, pe the people in politics, people in government, uh, the policy makers, um, if you just tell them it's the war on drugs, people have a right to put whatever they want to in their body and you're not letting them and that's why, pe that's why you're killing people, it, it, it's not going to get you anywhere. So they want numbers. They want util, a utilitarian argument. That's what organizations like the Cato Institute focuses on, using utilitarian arguments, things that resonate with the people who unfortunately have control over our lives that could persuade them. Because even if the moral argument is the, we know the moral argument is the right argument, unfortunately, the moral is the practical. So we just have to focus on the practical end of the argument and persuading people. So I just want to give you some takeaways uh, so that when you get into discussions with people who aren't, who don't get it the way we get it, you could be armed with some useful data. So the big narrative that's going around that's in an echo chamber out there that everybody who's making laws, and in fact they did this in Arizona last week as you probably know, the, the, they, have, they bought into this notion that uh, doctors who don't know what they're doing or are lazy got influenced by greedy pharmaceutical companies and got all of these innocent people out there who were in pain hooked on opioids who then became drug addicts. And what we got to do is we got to stop people from taking opioids and we got to get these doctors under control and then we're going to cure the problem. It's completely wrong. Very quickly, um, the, back in my, my day when I was a medical student, um, there, I was a product of the war on drugs. Richard Nixon was president when I was in college. Uh, the war on drugs was in, in high gear, and doctors as well as patients all became, kind of came, grew up under that regime. And um, so that I remember for many years when I was practicing surgery into the late 80s, early 90s, um, because of the way I was taught, I was very stingy giving pain medicine to my patients. But it worked on the other side too. I'd be seeing post-op patients, I'm a surgeon, I'd be seeing post-op patients in agony. Uh, I'd visit them day after surgery and say, you look like you're in a lot of pain. Uh, did you let the nurse know? Because I have morphine order. Oh no, I don't want to become an addict. So you had this what's called opiophobia on both, both sides of the, of the spectrum, from the doctor's end and the patient's end. Many scholarly articles started coming out from respected institutions saying, you know, actually, when, when taking medically, opioids are actually pretty safe. And we're under-medicating patients, and this is based on irrational fear that's not evidence-based. And this went down to even the Department of HHS, National Institute on Drug Abuse, they were all encouraging doctors and patients to relax about this. By the uh, late 90s, that started happening. So we saw uh, patients uh, more willing to use opioids, doctors more willing to prescribe it. As a result, the, the amount of opioids in existence increased. And of course, the pharmaceutical manufacturers weren't happy to provide us with these opioids. That's fine. That's what they do. As more, uh, as, as people, uh, as more prescription opioids became available in, in circulation, obviously those who wanted to use them non-medically, as we like to say, people who, you know, uh, people who are not following the doctor's prescription to take it. Drug users, because they want to get high, there was obviously more prescription opioids available for what people in the policy world call diversion into the black market, uh, either through, you know, faking illness to get a prescription and then sell it, or robbing drug stores, or raiding the medicine cabinet, or whatever. So by the early 2000s, we started to see uh, a high, the, actually the government started really focusing on this the late 90s, so we didn't have data going back 
we don't have detailed data going back before 1999, but by, by the early 2000s, there were, there was a, it was starting to become evident there were a lot of opioid overdose deaths. So based upon this false narrative, uh, the, the response was to try to clamp down on the amount of prescription opioids in, avail in, in the circulation. One way was by actually every state now set up these surveillance boards called pres prescription drug monitoring programs that actually keep doctors and patients under surveillance and use methods to kind of intimidate doctors into cutting back their prescriptions, including arresting some if they fall outside the norm in terms of the amount they prescribe. So that's got a lot of doctors kind of practicing in fear and under medicating patients. In addition, of course, you've all watched the news, so there's a lot of kind of a media campaign to, to get to, to bring back those good old days of opiophobia, so you're having more and more patients hear these horror stories and feel that they're going to get hooked and they start suddenly requesting to not be put on opioids when a doctor wants to prescribe it. In addition, um, the government has encouraged what's the development of what's called abuse deterrent formulations of opioids. Uh, OxyContin was the first one to do that in 2010. So they, they, they're now replacing uh, the opioids out there with opioids that cannot be crushed to be used for snorting or liquefied to be used for injecting if you're a non-medical user. Well, because they got the, the wrong narrative, it's not working. Every year we hear the, the overdose death rates going up, 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 so despite all of these interventions. In addition, Scientific study after scientific study after scientific, endless studies have shown that pain patients placed on prescription opioids, chronic non-cancer pain patients, have an approximately 1% addiction rate. Now, it is important for us to all remember there's a difference between addiction and chemical dependency. So when you're on an opioid for a long period of time, you can become chemically dependent and you need to be weaned off of it or you can get withdrawal symptoms. But that's not the same thing as addiction, which is, you know, on a, on a molecular level is a, is a disease. Alcoholism is a form of addiction where um, even when you detox, you want to go back on it. You'll make damaging life decisions uh, because the drug takes precedence over everything else. And addiction is about a 1% rate. In fact, just last week, January 17th, a few days before Arizona's legislature, in a rush, in just three days, placed restrictions on doctors prescribing opioids starting in 2019 to patients, a study came out from Harvard and Johns Hopkins. They studied one million patients from the years 2008 to 2016. It was published in a British medical journal they call it BMJ to these days. And they found in uh, patients who were placed on opioids for acute and post-operative pain, a 0.6% they call it misuse, misuse rate. Misuse is using the diagnostic codes from the manual. That's a large spectrum. So uh, addiction is a, is, is a misuse code, but so is taking it for a headache when you were given it for your incisional pain. So out of all misuse codes, 0.6% misuse rate. That's just the latest study, just a couple of weeks old, showing the same thing that we've known for a long time, that patients being given opioids by their doctors for acute pain very low addiction potential. Nevertheless, the people making the decisions here, they just don't buy into it. So I'm just going to show you a few slides here. And I don't like to, I want to get too heavy here in statistics. I'm just going to give you a few things that take away so that when you get in discussions with people who don't get, you know, the non-aggression pr principle and they don't get, um, you know, how prohibition in general is going to cause people to die. Um, uh, th this way, uh, just give me a second here to get my papers in order. I just want to give you some data to use. So first of all, um, according to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, uh, non-medical use of prescription opioids peaked in the year 2012, and total use of prescription opioids peaked in the year 2014. Okay. Um, also, according to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, this is government numbers, only about 25% of people who present with opioid overdoses report having ever obtained a prescription for opioids. So again, this is the government's own numbers are showing this is people using drugs in the black market because we have drug prohibition. Now these are the latest statistics. This is from now, from 2006, they're always a year behind. The CDC collects data 
And so we just got in December the statistics for, for 2016, and next December we'll get the 2017 numbers. But every year they've been going up. And if you see, out of roughly 64,000 total over, uh, overdose deaths in 2016, and when they do, they, they only collect deaths from uh, certain classes of drugs. 20,500, I'm not looking at the slide, so I'm going from memory, I'm rounding off. 20,500 from fentanyl and other fentanyl analogs. This is purely synthetic opioids. Fentanyl is very powerful, 50 times the, the strength of, of, of uh, heroin, 100 times the strength of morphine. And it's also a very useful drug. We use it all the time to provide anesthesia to patients and in critically ill patients and in the forms of skin patches, mostly is in the outpatient setting. But 20,500 of the 64,000 fentanyl, okay? Another 15,000 and change heroin. And if you notice there, 14,000 is uh, prescription opioids. And that has been leveling off over the years. I want to see the next slide push up, right? Did I push the up button or go like that? Okay, good. This, now this is from that same study from this National Center for Health Statistics. Um, and what they found is that fentanyl, uh, fentanyl uh, from 1999 to, to, to 2013 uh, increased at an annual rate of 18% a year. Then from 2013 to 2016 increased at a rate of 88% a year. Okay? Heroin increased at a rate of 33% a year from 2010 to 2014 and then 19% a year ever since. But prescription opioids have been increasing at an annual rate of 3% per year since 2009, which is kind of keeping up with the population growth. So again, the problem is not prescription opioids, it's the black market. So what's happening is, as prescription opioids are becoming cut back on through prescriptions, through oh, the, uh, the DEA ordered 25% reduction in the manufacturing of all opioids in 20, uh, 2017, another 20% this year. So as the supply is being cut back of prescription opioids, then the people using opioids in the non-medical, in, in, for non-medical reasons in the black market are just changing to other types of opioids that are available. Also, I'm gonna be, uh, a study that I did for the Cato Institute is gonna be published this Tuesday, where we show that these abuse deterrent types of opioids are actually just made non-medical users say, ah, screw it, if I can't crush this or dissolve it, I'll just buy the heroin because heroin sells for roughly one-fifth the street price of a prescription opioid. It's about $40 for oxy, they call it oxy, as you might know. About $40 for oxy on the street is about $15 for a little bag of heroin. So why, why screw around if I can't get this thing to crush, I'll just buy the heroin. Um, so, uh, and this, this graph here, is that the one that has the trends? Uh, yeah, that's the one with the trends. Uh, okay, I can, I can walk around, right? So I can look at it. All right, so this shows, Based upon the, the trends, um, starting in 2010, when the uh, prescriptions for opioids started getting cut back and the supply got cut back, you can see what happened to the trend line. The trend was, had things continued, overdoses from prescription opioids would have gone uh, to roughly uh, 5.75 uh, per million population. Instead, it went down to 4.84. But look what happened to heroin and fentanyl. It went from projection of 2.62 to 6.30. So you could basically argue for every one prescription opioid overdose we saved by cutting back on their availability, we just got four heroin and fentanyl overdose deaths. But they don't learn, they just keep doing the same thing. And then there's this one other slide, I hope this. This one, I'm gonna leave up, keep looking at this. If th this, this should be embedded in your brain. If there's any takeaway, it's this. You can see in this slide, um, the red line is the prescription the, the, the prescription rate, the rate of uh, opioid prescriptions, and the green line, the other lines are broken down by type, but the green line is all opioid overdose deaths. And you can see from uh, 2006 to 2010, they basically, were, and this is a, a, a 0.98 correlation, by the way, positive 0.98 correlation. They stayed steady, they tracked with each other. There was roughly one opioid overdose death for every 13,000 prescriptions written. Then, around 2010 is when all these things went into effect. The abuse deterrent formulations, the prescription drug monitoring programs, 
the cutbacks, the, the urging doctors to cut back on prescribing, and the cutbacks on manufacturing. And you can see the two lines start to diverge. And actually, there's a minus 0.99 correlation. So as the availability, uh, as the prescriptions went down, the overdose deaths went up. And there's no sign of it, uh, of it stopping. So um, if you get in discussions with people outside of this room, and they're wanting, uh, and, and they're not buying that the, uh, that the war on drugs is what's killing people, give them some of this data. Because obviously, everybody in this room understands when you have prohibition, you don't know what you're getting. And there's also incentives to increase the strength of things. For example, as you, you might be aware, fentanyl is being ordered over the internet and mailed into this country from factories in China and elsewhere, coming in the mail. And then a lot, there are, there are these uh, sort of pill factories in people's garages where they have these counterfeit Oxycontin capsules and they stuff it with the fentanyl and sell it on the street as Oxycontin. People are buying Oxycontin in the black market, they're not getting Oxycontin, they die. Or to sm a lot of the black tar heroin coming in from Mexico, um, it's, it's smuggled, they put in these little tiny balloons that they then tie with a knot and they can stick it inside the, their cheeks and walk across the border with several of these little balloons of heroin in their mouths and that's how they smuggle into the country. Well, you can make those even smaller if you add some fentanyl to it because then you're increasing the potency and you can smuggle more in. Prohibition, of course, gives incentives for smugglers to try to increase the potency of what they're smuggling so they can get more bang for their buck. So these are the kind of things that are driving the death rate. Um, now, you, uh, of course, the, so the, the real answer is end the war on drugs and you'll end the overdose crisis. But I don't expect you know, Governor Ducey to suddenly call for ending the war on drugs. Actually, there have been some political leaders that have done that. As you know, the mayor of Baltimore had done that, Kurt Smoke, several years ago. Uh, Gary Johnson, when he was the uh, governor of New Mexico, called for it. But generally speaking, I don't expect any governor or senator or any major political leaders to get behind the idea of ending the war on drugs anytime soon. So if you want to move things like you know, Mark was leading, alluding to before I came on, there are those of us who say, all right, well, let me, freedom, the more I can move things more in the direction of freedom, the more I'm making things better. Even if I can never see the ideal world of freedom in my lifetime, if I can move it in that direction, I'm doing something good. So one of the things that I advocate when I speak to policymakers is say, okay, so what would you do? So I say, well, first of all, stop pressuring doctors to stop prescribing pain medicine for their patients. Let them take care of their patients, okay? That's number one. Number two, most of us, when we see, and there are some, I see some doctors in the room, when we see one of, one of our patients maybe developing a dependency and requiring uh, the, the pain medication longer than usually we see for this kind of problem, a responsible doctor has a conversation with the patient and says, you know, I think you might be getting dependent on this. Maybe we should start working on getting you tapered off. That's what we do. Just let us do our job. Sure, there are guys who, there are doctors who are not good at doing their job or not honest, but the old war majority of us, that's what we took an oath to do, to do good. So that's number one. Number two, take all this energy that you're putting into trying to you know, build a wall to stop this from coming over, which ain't going to happen. It's not going to stop it. Um, or or to, uh, to just, you know, intimidate people into not using it. Put that into harm reduction programs. They've been proven to save lives. Example, we know that uh, methadone maintenance and also suboxone maintenance, they call it medication-assisted treatment in the, in the medical world. These are ways in which you can get people who want to get off of their addiction to something like heroin, you get them onto something uh, that allows them to not, to, to be clear-headed, avoid withdrawal, and then over time, if they're ready, you could gradually wean them off of that and, and get them detoxed. If not, at least they're, you know, they're cognitively functioning, they're not, they're not uh, euphoric, they're just avoiding the symptoms of withdrawal and able to lead a productive life. Right now, there's so many restrictions by the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, on the, on the creation and establishment of methadone maintenance centers that there are a way too few and there's a backlog of people wanting it. So that's, you know, you, we, could, we could loosen those restrictions, uh, make it less onerous to establish methadone maintenance programs. Same thing with suboxone. Suboxone is sort of like methadone 
And people in the business argue over which is more effective as a medication-assisted treatment, but the bottom line is that Suboxone is approved for doctors to prescribe, so you don't have to go to a special methadone maintenance clinic. But there are a lot of these rules, you gotta take a special course, and then there's limits on how many patients you could have at a given time. And even though they're beginning to loosen that up, it needs to be loosened up a lot more. And right now, it's only restricted to doctors. So if you're a nurse practitioner or a, or a physician's assistant, you gotta get a special waiver to be able to prescribe this stuff. So these things need, again, to be opened up and be made more available. Uh, for, since the 1980s, we've known that what they call, what the CDC calls syringe in uh, safe syringe programs. The CDC endorses this, by the way, where not just clean needle exchange programs, but supervised injection facilities, or safe injection rooms is another name for that, really save lives. So uh, one thing that, by the way, they are, they are not prohibited in this country. So there are several cities that have needle exchange programs where you know, you, 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 you're given a clean needle and syringe and then you go shoot up but the, and the, the idea is you're not spreading, but you're not sharing needles, you're not spreading disease. On the other hand, once you're done with it, we don't know what you do with it. You sell it, it you, eventually you're starting to spread disease. And also, you know, you, you're not around anybody, so if you overdose, nobody could, could help you. So the advantage of a safe injection room or supervised injection facility, these are all different names for it, is you, you, you know, it's, it's BYO, so you bring your own, you go into this room, you give it a clean needle and syringe, there's personnel around, you inject, then you leave the needle and syringe with them so they can make sure it gets discarded in a sterile fashion. And there's somebody around with naloxone, the antidote to opioid overdose, so in case you happen to overdose because the heroin was laced with fentanyl and you didn't know it, they're there to rescue you. They're also there to suggest if you need help, you know, I can get you some people who can help you. So that's been proven that there are hundreds of them in every country except the U.S. In Seattle, the city council a year ago voted to try to set up one as a pilot program, and all the state legislators shut it down because they said it sends the wrong message that we're actually setting up rooms where people could inject heroin. We're saying that it's okay. So, you know, I don't have to explain to people in this room. First of all, it's okay to do whatever you want to do as long as you don't hurt me. But aside from that, the, the whole idea behind harm reduction is to say, I'm being non-judgmental. I'm accepting the fact that we're never going to have a so-called drug-free society because as far back as history has been, has been written, there's always been, I think it's a human quality to seek mind-altering drugs. And, and as far back as we can go, whether we're talking about you know, uh, peyote or mushrooms, we're never gonna have a drug-free society. So the idea behind harm reduction is let's try to make less people get hurt. Let's people spread disease, let's people overdose. If, if you're gonna use drugs, at least use them safely. Now, ideally, I, like I say, we shouldn't, we, sh we, we shouldn't settle for that, but that's a whole lot better than locking people up and preventing doctors from uh, uh, you know, helping their patients in pain. So with that, uh, let me see, do I have any time left? Yeah, I can take some questions. Yeah, Kristen. Right. Thanks for, because I, I, I meant to bring that whole topic up, so thanks for asking that. Yeah, for those who didn't hear, uh, it was this summer a study uh, was published in the, in the uh, Journal of Public Health from Emory University. Uh, they found that since uh, marijuana was legalized for recreational use in 2014 in Colorado, the overdose rate from opioids actually went down 6%. The rest of the country has been going up. Um, and now, of course, it's only two years, we don't have enough data, and we don't have data from the other states, like Washington. But uh, there have been several studies, uh, uh, at least a couple of studies showing, both the Rand Corporation study and the Johns Hopkins study showing, uh, where they studied the states from 1999 to 2014, all states where medical marijuana was available. And they found that there was in general, a 25% lower rate of opioid overdose and opioid use in those states than in the other states. Uh, and uh, uh, a University of Michigan medical school study found that people who, uh, are living in, who are chronic pain patients who live in states where medical marijuana is available have decreased uh, their intake of opioids by 64%, which is impressive. And then just, just this summer, University of California School of Public Health in Berkeley 
they found in California, 97% of people who are in chronic pain find that by using medicinal marijuana, they've been able to reduce their opioid intake. And 80% said it seemed to work better for them than the opioid for their pain. And there's a lot of also research suggesting uh, uh, CBD, cannabidiol, one of the in ingredients in, uh, in cannabis, uh, actually acts on the, the same receptor sites, they call mu receptors in the brain that opioids do. Um, there been, there's been some research suggesting it might be useful in um, decreasing opioid withdrawal symptoms, so it might be a, a helpful tool in helping uh, people addicted to opioids or dependent on opioids from getting off of it. But in addition, it also kind of explains why that people have been able to reduce their, their, uh, their content, their intake of opioids when they're, they're using marijuana. Once again, keeping it illegal, of course, is all contributing to the death, to the death rate. So um, if we, uh, another good thing that we could try to, it looks like we're almost there. You know, so many states now have made marijuana available either medically or recreationally. I think we're almost at that tip, tipping point. Uh, it's not as good as legalizing all drugs, but if we legalize marijuana, I think that'll actually help the opioid overdose rate. Um, about another thing is, you may or may not be aware in this room, but in 2001, Portugal said this isn't working. They had the highest overdose rate in the EU. So they decriminalized drugs, totally decriminalized all drugs. Now, politically speaking, it's probably easier to decriminalize than to legalize because technically it's, it's by decriminalizing, you're not saying it is legal to do this. You're just saying we're not going to do anything about it. So, you know, when you're trying to push an idea past a resistant population, that's, that's, that's more doable. And what they found in 2000, according to 2015's numbers, they now have the lowest overdose rate in Western Europe. They have six overdoses per million population compared to the United States where we have 312 per million population. Uh, they've had a 75% reduction in heroin users because they have sort of like their version of the CDC that keeps track of these things. 75% reduction. And what they've done is they still do uh, uh, arrest big major drug smugglers, but otherwise they don't spend much time with law enforcement at all. They just focus everything on harm reduction. If, you, if, if a policeman sees an addict uh, in an alleyway who looks like he's you know, not doing so well, the policeman rescues him and tries, tries to persuade him to get into a, a rehab program. Nothing's forced. So uh, it's been so successful that just this past December, the legislature in Norway voted to do the same thing. Hasn't been implemented yet because they just voted for it. So maybe we're going to start to see that, uh, you know, just like with marijuana, decriminalization will start to, not as good as legalization, but it's a whole lot better than the drug war, will start to, to roll around the, the developed world. And, uh, and so that's a good thing. Also, another misconception, I read an, uh, an op-ed a few weeks ago in the Washington Post by a columnist saying, you know, we have this huge opioid overdose rate and there's no opioid overdose problem in Europe at all. Why? Because, well, because we have universal, they have universal health care and, uh, um, and, and they don't prescribe opioids for their patients like we do here in this country. Well, the fact is that um, the EU has also an opioid overdose crisis. Uh, they admit that they don't have the uh, data collection capacity that the CDC has because they're sort of a patchwork of various countries and there hasn't been a lot of good coordination, but they've been having an increasing opioid overdose rate as well. And it's true, this is culturally, as a rule, physicians in Europe tend to um, pres not prescribe opioids, ne never have been. That's just kind of the way they've been taught. And they tend to tell patients to suck it up. You're supposed to have pain. You had an operation. Take an aspirin. That's the way they practice. Uh, in fact, there was a recent, uh, just the other day in the Washington Post, some patient who got back from getting surgery in Germany was talking about how wonderful it was. You know, I had a knee surgery, and my doctor said, deal with it. And I did. See, that's, they know how to do it. So anyway, be that as it may, the fact that they're also having an opioid overdose crisis as well, and Australia, which has socialized medicine, has an opioid overdose crisis, and by the way, they have safe injection rooms there. And Canada, which, has this, which we all know about the Canadian system, has the second highest opioid overdose crisis 
death rate rather in the, in the developed world, second only to us. So it's not a factor of, once again, doctors prescribing opioids. It's a factor of people accessing um, opioids through the black market. And we all know, when I go to buy a bottle of you know, tequila at the supermarket, and it says 80 proof, actually I don't drink tequila, so I don't know what it says in there, but whatever it says, I'm not saying, gee, I wonder if it's what it says on, the, on that bottle. I wonder if it's, or I wonder if it's laced with something else and when I drink it, I'm gonna get poisoned because it's legal. And there's a legal market and there's competition and there's a, a, a way to sue. All of the things that happen in the legal market. You wanna end opioid overdose deaths? Of course, you really want opi if you're really serious about it, you wanna end the war on drugs. And, uh, any more? I got, I got like three or four more minutes. Yes, uh, Jeffrey. It's a, an absurd question. I'm just, confu I'm just confused. Where do these black market opiates come from? Well, some of them. Uh, how do they? Where do they? Yeah. Well, they uh, some uh, some people. Um, there's many different ways. Some people, for example, uh, go to doctors and you know say they're in a lot of pain and they get a prescription and they were never in pain. Of course, pain is subjective. I can tell you as a doctor, one of my patients looking like he's in agony, and some they can be very good actors. I'm not going to not give him something, and then he, I never see him again, and he's of course never intended to use it. He's going to sell it. That's one way. Some people, you know, raid mom and dad's medicine cabinet. Uh, some people draw, rob drug stores or warehouses. But more and more recently, it's counterfeit stuff being sold, uh, you know, on a black market where they they have these capsules that look like the prescription opioid, and it's really not prescription opioid that's in it. That's the latest Breaking thing. Bad, making the stuff in the trailers, right? Like not, not the prescription opioids, but, uh, well, heroin is, of course, it comes in both from Afghanistan, and we, of course, help them there with our soldiers. And, <laughs> and, and, but mo most of the East Coast heroin is white powder heroin coming in from Afghanistan, but, uh, and the West Coast in, in, in middle America has been black tar heroin coming up from Mexico. Although now uh, they are, have such an efficient distribution system that that spread all, the black tar heroin is spreading all over the country. It's very cheap, very easy to, because it, it's, it's not as refined. That's why it's black tar. Um, and then fentanyl is manufactured in factories all around the world, particularly in China. We lean, lean on China to clamp down on the fa fentanyl factories. So they say some law saying you can't make fentanyl, and then the Chinese manufacturers just add a molecule to it and make it slightly different. Like you may have heard of car fentanyl, which some people refer to as the elephant tranquilizer. It's so powerful that it could actually make an elephant go into a coma. Um, so that's what's been coming in lately too, because they say, okay, I'm not making fentanyl anymore, just like you told me. I'm gonna add this little <laughs> molecule, and I'm gonna send that. And, and besides, we all know, it's like pushing in a balloon. You push it in here, the air comes out there. So if China clamps down on it, then they'll make it somewhere else because there's a market for it. Any, yes, Rick? Uh, yes. Uh, just to make it clear, you cannot, a doctor cannot prescribe fentanyl in a useful form other than the patches, which you can't overdose <coughs> or abuse because it's a slow release thing. The fentanyl that we're talking about we use for anesthesia only. Right. We can't prescribe it. The, the street fentanyl is never used in an outpatient setting no, by doctors. Never. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So th that's, a, you know, you, some people may have received it. It's, a, it's on a skin patch called Duragesic is the, one of the brand names. There's also a, a spray that was recently developed and uh, a nasal spray. And, and it's, it's kind of like a, a film that you could put on the inside of your mouth that slowly dissolves. And there's some lozenges, very minimal dose that slowly get absorbed. These are usually used in terminal cancer patients who, for whom everything else has stopped working, they're a lot of pain. But even that, you can't, they're not suitable for abuse. You know, you, you can't. Uh, well, you know, during the break, you might wanna. Any other questions? Any other questions? Other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr.